Pal June, it's so great to have you on CNBC. It's been a while. It's been a while. Um, walk me through Global Foundries because this is um, a huge deal for you guys. You IPO'd uh, 2.6 billion plus you raised, and this was the third biggest listing on a U.S. exchange this year. Um, when you think about that with regards to the bigger picture, which is the global chip shortage, was this just good timing or was this in the pipeline for a while? You know, I hear you say that. The third largest IPO of the year in the United States, and then I uh, think about this is the largest semiconductor IPO uh, by market cap ever. And I go back to 2007 when we started this, uh, this investment journey, and I'll tell you that's exactly what we planned. 2021, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's, uh, I, think, um, I think we made a very good now in retrospect uh, thematic view in terms of where we, see, where we saw this industry going back in 2007. And of course, I think over the last uh, 12, 13 years, uh, it's been an incredible journey uh, with reaching a very important milestone, uh, which is taking that company public uh, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, two months ago. So you're planning to spend as much as a billion to increase capacity. How soon do you think we'll see an end to this global chip shortage? When will supply meet demand? Well, you know, we've lived through that journey. When we entered that business back in 07, it was, um, it was AMD. It was investing in a company which we thought was going to be a company that will be very successful, that had uh, a differentiated technology, but that was, at that point, doing two different things, doing the design side of it and the manufacturing side of it. I think the view we took back then was, of course, with AMD, that the manufacturing side needs to be spun off because uh, achieving scale and being able to compete uh, on a global platform required it to essentially service many customers. So turning from an aspect of a business within AMD that was serving one customer in AMD to then being an independent manufacturer, an independent foundry, that led to the establishment of global foundries and eventually what we'll talk about a bit more, which is the journey of global foundries. I think that was the first very important decision point back in 07. AMD back then was small. I think had you know very interesting prospect. Uh, we had a very, I would say, strong view uh, about the semiconductor business, technology, where, where it was going. And I think we made a big bet on AMD. Uh, and over the years, uh, AMD, you know the story, uh, has been an incredible success. Its CEO, uh, Lisa, has been one of the most incredible CEOs, I think, in the, in the, in, in the sector, uh, well, to be honest, in, the, in business overall. Really phenomenal CEO. And with that, we've seen AMD become now uh, the player we, we were always hoping for uh, back in 07. GF, on the other hand, which is Global Foundries, that was established uh, in 2009. So it took about you know, a period bet bet between our first initial investment in AMD until we established GF. And GF was a wholly owned business by us as, as Mubadala. We were the, uh, the, the sole shareholder uh, of Global Foundries. And we started in a journey of taking that company from servicing one customer, AMD, to servicing over 200 customers. And that journey started with um, three probably important stops. One was acquiring uh, Chartered Semiconductor in Singapore uh, in 2009. I think that was a very important uh, move very early on. Uh, why? Because in acquiring uh, char uh, Chartered, we entered the Asian market. We had a foothold to Chartered in Asia, in Singapore. Uh, it was an incredibly experienced management team that knowed how to, knew how to handle customers. They were servicing already uh, over 100 uh, customers uh, globally. So that helped in that cultural change that needed to happen uh, with Global Foundries from servicing one customer to obviously becoming uh, a global platform. That was an important one. 2015 was another very, very important milestone when we acquired IBM's foundry business. Another very, very important move. Uh, IBM's, the IBM acquisition gave us scale, gave us uh, incredible talent, inc incredible patents, uh, and again, the ability to, to grow and scale up. And I think the third was really a combination of what's happened over the last four years. One a management team led by Tom, an exceptional CEO, exceptional, really a top-notch management team at GF, and I think you can't do anything without the people, and I think the people and the leadership of GF really, 
I think, uh, uh, took a significant rise in terms of uh, capability and in terms of performance with, with, the, with, with, with Tom, combined with COVID. I think the world suddenly woke up and realized how semiconductors are crucial to the global economy. And, and I think that really, the combination of incredible management, uh, you know, a great heritage and story of 12 years of commitment and growth and build up, and then the market essentially turning in the way uh, we expected it or anticipated or hoped it would turn at some point. Yeah. In terms of that growth and the need, supply meeting demand, what's your outlook? Because you have a bird's eye view on this at this point. So it took 50 years for the semiconductor business to turn into a half a trillion dollar business. It's going to take probably eight to 10 years to double. And it's going to double right after that probably in four to five years. So you take that as one very important data point. You combine that with another very relevant data point. There's only five players. There's five foundry businesses, global foundry businesses, four of which are in Asia. Yeah. One, of which, one of which, global foundries, yeah. has, I think, the unique differentiated platform of being in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia. Bless you guys for that, because that leads to my next question, which is one about um, thoughts on Capitol Hill right now. There is a school of thought that um, as a U.S. chip maker, as a U.S. semiconductor company, um, there should be allocation given um, for a certain amount of chips or semiconductors not to leave the country. What would you say to members of Congress who are considering that as the best option as they struggle with trying to figure out what to do about the stops in gl the global supply chain? I think the last couple of years have taught us a lot on the geopolitics and how it turns, particularly in sensitive industries, on uh, supply chains that can be massively disruptive with pandemics. And I think when you take that into account and when you see what, you, what we can see today uh, in terms of what's happened over the last three or four years and what we anticipate will happen in the next five to 10, ten years, I think it's very important to, to, to really secure uh, important supply chains for very specific industries, uh, of which semiconductors, I would say, is on the top of the list. Yeah. But is it a good idea for the U.S. to push that kind of idea? I think supporting the industry in the United States uh, is crucial. Yeah. There's no doubt in my, in my mind. I think uh, the United States economy, the United States is, the, uh, is, is obviously fundamental for, for the global economy. I think when you look at uh, the future, when you look at the past, when it comes to technology and innovation, the United States is going to be and will continue to be, I think, at the forefront of that. Yeah. And I think semiconductors is at the heart of that. So making sure that semiconductor and semiconductor manufacturing is well developed and well preserved in the United States uh, and allowed to grow to support uh, the future growth trajectory of the U.S. economy, I think that's a very important idea. You have this company, 89% of which is owned by Mabadla. You're based in the United States. You have 8,000 plus American employees. and. At this point, um, there's a big question about what's going to happen next in U.S.-China relations. As the UAE, you're smack dab in the middle of all of that. They're one of your largest foreign direct investors. And lawmakers, on and off record, have often suggested to me that they are questioning, at the very least, those relationships. It worries them. And even an, an arms deal was put on hold because of it. When you take a step back and think about it as an investor, as a business, what is your greatest concern there? Are we going to see a Cold War between the United States and China? Well, you're giving me a very easy question here. Let me see how I'm going to answer that. Let me start with the, it is in the interest of everyone to have a global integrated economy. That served us well over, over in the past and I think will help in the future not just the United States, but I would say every country around the world. So I think I am personally uh, of a view that the issues we're seeing today are, are quite substantial, particularly between uh, some countries, the United States and China here specifically. But I think they're not issues that are insurmountable. When I look at it in the context, and you've asked me that question as a business uh, leader, I see it very plain vanilla from my perspective. Uh, the United States is the world's largest economy. China is the second largest economy. For now. For now. And in, in a matter of time, China will be the largest economy. Yeah. 
you know, is it five years, is it 10 years, is it 20 years? People will take different views, but it will happen at some point. In today's lens, these are the two largest economies in the world. And for any investor, for any business leader, and for any supplier of anything, having access to these markets, to these two markets particularly, but having open access, I think is very, very important. So anything that helps maintain a, uh, an environment that allows that access and allows uh, companies and of course countries to benefit from open trade, I think this is conducive for growth. So back to me. We're, all, we're, we're, we're as a country here in the UAE, uh, a country built on uh, commerce, trade, growth. That's what we're all about. Uh, we trade with East, we trade with West, North, South, we trade with everyone. That's what's been the foundation of success for the UAE over the last 50 years. And when, when you look at the next 50 years, if anything, we're doubling down and tripling down on that. And to do so, we have to continue to grow with the West, the United States, Europe, uh, South America. We have to also double down on the East. These are incredible economies, China, India, Japan, Korea, very important markets, markets that we've had, I would say, exceptional relationships over the last 15 years, 50 years, and relationships that we want to grow. So we want to be in that middle. It's a good position for us to be in the middle, and it's a good position for us to continue to be an objective, uh, commercially conducive uh, investor, investment location, but also investor yeah. in, an, in, in this growth story. You're still very bullish on the U.S. What worries you there? Is the Fed doing enough? Do we need a rate hike? What about inflation? Listen, when you're a long-term investor like us, I think these challenges, interest rates, inflation, uh, cycles, uh, energy cycles, semiconductor cycles, they come with the territory. You know, we, we were designed to, uh, to you anticipate. You think it's transitory, the inflation? It's transitory. It's absolutely transitory. I take a long-term view on the United States, and I, have a, I continue to have a positive bullish view on the U.S. market. Yeah. Um, cryptocurrencies, is that something that as a business, as a sovereign wealth fund, you're looking at? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's real. Uh, I think, you know, this is a business that had, what, $200 billion worth of uh, crypto value two years ago, and it's $2.5 trillion today and, and growing. So I, I think while many people are skeptics, I, I, I do not fall in that category. I think now I see it as, as real. Now, I think the regulatory environment that's, that, that isn't there yet in its, uh, in its final form and will have to be there at some point, I think will come in and will help, I think, um, transition uh, this, this asset class into, into something new. From our perspective, I think we look at the uh, ecosystem around uh, crypto, and I think we are investing in that ecosystem. That could be, that's in blockchain technology, uh, energy usage, uh, et cetera. So uh, that's my answer to that. Keldun, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for joining us.